like, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. We kind of took a break from our messages on hope last Sunday, being Easter Sunday, and so but now we're going to jump back into this. And we were in 1 Peter chapter 1 before, and we're actually going to pick up right where we left off. Uh, Peter actually had a lot to say about the subject of hope, and it was kind of an important message to the people of that day. Things seemed pretty hopeless in the days that they, they took Jesus and crucified him, and then he's gone and such, and so many of the people had lost hope. They placed all their faith in Jesus, and, and then to see him crucified uh, kind of was a blow to their faith, if you will. But then, of course, he rose again, showed himself alive, and th then hope began to spread. So Peter talks quite a bit about the subject of hope. Now today, as you can see on the wall, we want to talk about the subject of heavenly hope. You know, we've kind of looked in what we should have hope in and how we should have hope and how long we should have hope. But today I want us to look at where do we place our hope. You know, this world that we live in today, there's a lot of problems in the world, amen? I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news. That's why I usually don't, because it can be depressing when you watch the news and see all the things that are going on in the world and all the fighting and, and the wars and, of course, this pandemic that we just can't seem to get away from, you know, and, and, and that sort of a thing. And so we look at this world, and, and, and it's hard to place any faith in this world, this world that we live in. So, And actually, the Bible encourages us to have, as we're going to see, a heavenly hope. You know, if you, today, I would hope uh, that you're saved, that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. You know, at that moment in time, you think about it, go back to when you first accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you first called upon the Lord to save your soul. Uh, when was that day? You know, Jesus told old Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. You know, we've heard that phrase over the years, and a lot of people don't understand what that means. And Nicodemus didn't understand, even though he was a, a doctor of the law uh, in that day. And he still didn't understand what Jesus meant to be born again. And Jesus explained to him, he says, listen, everyone is born of flesh and blood, uh, but we must be born of the Spirit. And that's what he was talking about, being born again. When, did you, when were you born again? You know, not a lot of people are fortunate to, to remember their spiritual birthday. We all know our physical birthday. We like to celebrate with birthday cakes and presents and all that sort of thing. But not too many people actually remember their spiritual birthday. But we should remember when we got saved. You know, I'm fortunate the pastor that led me to the Lord says, Brian, remember this day. And so I can remember you know, the actual day that I got saved. And on that day, I know that is the day that I was born again. Are you saved today? God loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. And we are sinners. Every one of us. And the Bible says sin cannot enter, enter heaven. The Bible tells us the price of sin is death in hell. Separation from God. And somebody has to pay that price. And without Jesus, you're the one that has to pay it. But Jesus has paid the price. He died on the cross. He paid the price for sins. And he's offering that payment to you. And I'll tell you what. If somebody says, here, Brian, I want to give you $100 to pay a bill. Hesitate. I'm going to take that money, okay? I'm not even going to think twice about it. And when that preacher said, Brian, Jesus Christ died for you, and he's offering that payment to you, I said, yeah, I want that. And I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save my soul, to pay my price. And on that day, I know that I was saved. That was my spiritual birthday. Not because of anything I did, but because of what Jesus has already done on the cross of Calvary. And so on that day, that I received Christ as my Savior. Not only did I become a child of God, part of the family of God, but on that day, my destination was changed from hell to heaven. From that day, my hope has been in heaven. Looking forward to that day that I get to go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know when that day is. Hopefully it's a long time from now. You know, in, in 69 days, my boy's going to get married. And sometime after that, there's going to be some wee little ones along the way. And I'm going to finally be a grandpa. And how wonderful that would be. You know what stuff? There was a little fella who was in the grocery store yesterday. He was in with the mom. And, and he just kept giving me a little side eye. He didn't trust me, you know. But all the girls, he was giving them pretty eyes. And so, uh -huh, he's already flirting with the girls. But anyway, and so it's like, just you see those little ones. And they're so precious. And, and the best part about being grandparents is you spoil them, you sugar them up, and you send them home. Amen. <laughs> so, but anyway, looking forward to being able to do that and such. But uh, anyway, and so, I, you know, I have no desire to leave this life. You know, the Lord is blessed in a big way. You know, we all would have to say, if you're saved, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, 
we would have to say that we are blessed. Amen. That doesn't mean we don't have trials and tribulations. We all do. It's all a matter of what you focus upon. Matter of fact, just this morning as I was scrolling through Facebook, I don't even know who put it on there, but it was a picture. But it, it says that, it, that your attitude is everything. And what it is, you know, they have those, when you have a, a trophy presentation, there's first, <coughs> second, and third, you know, and first place is up on top, and second and third is down here. And the, there's a little kid, maybe five, six years old, he's standing on top in first place, and he's got his little award, and he's got a scowl on his face. But the kid in third place, he's down here in third place on the bottom. He just holding his plaque up, just grinning from ear to ear. Woo! -hoo! You know? And it's all the matter of our outlook. You know, we can look at our life and say, wow, oh, well, all these terrible things. I've got these health problems. I've got these family problems. I can't afford to pay my bills. And we can look at all of those things and say, how terrible life is. That's because you're putting your hope where? In this world. Or we can say, you know what? My hope is in heaven. I'm just passing through this lifetime. I'm a pilgrim, a sojourner, passing through this lifetime. And one day, whether it's through death or Jesus Christ should come back before I die, my destination is heaven. I have a heavenly hope. And I look forward to that day. I'm in no hurry to get there. I'm enjoying living the life that I live. You know, and I'm enjoying being able to do the things that I do to, to preach, to be able to minister to the people in the community. You know, we should learn to have that positive outlook and enjoy the life. But don't place our hope in this life, in this world. Listen, don't place your hope in people of this world. People will disappoint you. Plain and simple, okay? But that's okay. That's heaven. I guarantee you. You've disappointed somebody, amen? I've disappointed people. It's just, it's life. It's what it is. And so that's what the idea that we're trying to get. Our hope should be in heaven. That's where our hope lies. <laughs> heaven is a beautiful place, a wonderful place, an awesome place. Just what little bit the Bible tells us. I can't wait to get there, okay? I literally cannot wait to get to my home in heaven. Now, what's that home going to look like? I don't rightly know, okay? I believe, honestly... And this is my opinion. I believe honestly the life that we live now on this earth determines the kind of life that we're going to live in glory. Remember the story of the three little pigs? I didn't even remember the story. I tell you what, some of these children's fairy tales are pretty dark, amen? But anyway, the story of the three little pigs. You had three pigs. One built his house of straw, one built his house of wood, and one built his house of brick, amen? And when the wolf came along, he blew down the straw, he blew down the wood, but he could not blow down, blow down the brick, okay? He could not. And so what kind of a house are you building today in this life, in this world? Are you building a house of straw or a house of wood or a house of brick? The Bible even talks about that. You know, our works, when we get to heaven, they're going to be tried. If they're wood, hay, and stubble, they'll be burnt. But if they're stone and precious stone, then it will remain. So what kind of a life are we living now? What kind of a home are we building then? The life we live now sends treasures onto heaven then. And so we live life now with a heavenly hope, knowing that everything I do now in this life will make a difference then. Again, that's my opinion, but I believe it to be true. And so I want to live the best life that I can, with the best attitude that I can, doing all that I can for the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I going to make mistakes along the way? Most certainly. But we learn from those mistakes. And as we press on, as we go forward, as we uh, continue to get towards that prize, that heavenly home, that's when God can, can truly bless in a big way. So do we have this heavenly hope? Let's go ahead and read our text here this morning, if you will, okay? Uh, but in 1 Peter chapter 1, I want to read verses 18 through 23. So let's read that, okay? It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him, by Jesus, we do believe in God, that raised up Jesus from the dead and gave him glory, that our faith and hope might be in God. A heavenly hope, not a worldly hope, but a heavenly hope. And then he says, seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit of the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another, being born again, one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So basically that text is just saying what I've just said. 
We were not redeemed by the things of this world. We were redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, now I place my faith and hope in Him, and I want to live the best life that I can for God Almighty in heaven. And it's all right here in the mind. That's why my first point says that we need to have, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. That, that mind of God, that spiritual mind, if you will, that's the kind of mind we need to have today. Do you realize that all of our battles are won and lost in the mind? If you think you can't win, you've lost already. If you think you can't do something, you probably will not be able to. Our attitude determines so much about life itself. When you go into any kind of test, any kind of trial, if you've already got a negative attitude, you've already failed. That's why coaches for generations have been trying to pump their teams up. Even if the coach thinks in his mind, we have no chance of winning this game today, you know? His job is to pump the team up, to get them out there so that, you know what, it could, it could happen. You never know. They just had the men's college basketball championship final, whatever. And before the season ever, ever started, everybody said, oh, Gonzaga's going to win. They're the best team. They won 27 games in a row. Guess what? They didn't win. Baylor went into that game, and their coach says, listen, boys, we're going to win this thing. And they did. And a lot of it was attitude, okay? They believed that they were going to win, and they played as such. And so our mind is where a lot of these things are won and lost. And so we need to have, be heavenly-minded, if you will. A few weeks ago, I used this verse that you see up on the wall already. I used it in another one, talking about eternity, having hope for all of eternity, a hope that never ends. But also, I want to look at it in a different light. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says, If in this life, in other words, in this world, if, if in this world we have hope only in Jesus Christ, we are of most men, we are, of, excuse me, we are of all men most miserable. You know, I believe Christ will help me in my life today. But my hope is not just in this world. My hope is in heaven, in that place that I'm headed to. When Jesus left the earth... In John 14, you can look at stuff after church if you want to. But Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Basically, Jesus says to his disciples, listen, I'm here with you now to, to teach you, to help you to learn, to grow, to teach you what I want you to be and what I want you to do. But I'm going to go on into heaven. And when I go, I'm going to start preparing a place for you, for you personally. And if we're saved today and know Jesus Christ is our Savior, if we're born again, then that's where our home is. And Jesus is preparing that place. It's kind of like, you know, Christmas time and you know Grandma's fixing dinner. You know what I mean? As a child growing up, you know, come from a broken home and live with Dad and such. But for the holidays, we always went to Grandma's house. And as a kid, I can't tell you how exciting that was, you know, because, well... I love my dad. Dad, I know you're going to watch this later. I love you to death, okay? But he wanted to cook. Right? There's just no two ways around that. You know, his idea of, of cooking was, was hot dogs and, and fried bologna sandwiches. Not that there's anything wrong with fried bologna sandwiches, amen? But anyway, okay? And so, but when we went to Grandma's house, we had pork chops and roast and fried chicken and, and steak every once in a while. Grandma could cook. And when, when she cooked, but she, she'd just cover the table. She would. And so as a kid, thinking about going to Grandma's house for Christmas, it, it was just excitement. It was just so overflowing, so overwhelming, you know, just the idea. Yeah, sure, there was going to be presents, but for someone like me who liked food, <laughs> I couldn't wait for dinner at Grandma's house. It, just, it, it was never, ever did it disappoint and such. And so that hope was in that place where I was going to go, where we, and, and, it, and it never, I was never disappointed, ever. And in life, the same thing is true. Having this heavenly minded or this heaven mindset, if you will, is thinking that, yeah, you know, life is what I make of it here and now. Whether happy or sad, joyful or not, whatever. Life is what I make and I want to have a positive attitude. But what helps me get through this life now, gets through what I'm going through, through now, is knowing that one day I'm going to go to that place that Jesus is preparing for me. So my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in God Almighty, not in this world. And having that heavenly mindset, knowing that when everything is all said and done, when I get to glory, if I'm saved, if you're saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, okay, Jesus says there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so He's that door that allows us into heaven. <clears throat> we must repent of our sins and trust in Christ as our Savior. 
born again. And when I have that mindset, I know that when all is said and done, I'm going to be in glory. I look forward to that day. Again, not in a hurry to get there, but I look forward to that day to be able to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have any idea really what heaven is. As I've said before, several years ago, um, uh, the, the musical group Mercy Me, they had a song that says, I can only imagine. You know, and this song is talking about, you know, what's heaven going to be like? We just don't know. And we allow our imaginations to go of what it's going to be like and such. But anyway, in my version of heaven, the Browns will win the Super Bowl every year. <laughs> but anyway, I don't even know if they'll play football in heaven. Who knows? So, but anyway, heavenly minded, it helps us in this life that we live. Okay? But we also need to be happy minded. Happy, there's nothing wrong with being happy, amen? I think some people think it's a sin to be happy. Because they're always going through life so sad and down and downcast and depressed. There's no way to be. That is just absolute. We all have troubles, okay? Every one of us, whether it's physical troubles that we deal with. You know, there's so many things that we deal with today. So many people with the diabetes. So many people with heart problems and arthritis and allergies and stuff like that. Everybody has these things. Uh, most people I know struggle with finances. Even people that are rich struggle with finances, okay? And who of us doesn't have family problems? We all have these things. We all deal with these things in our life, okay? doesn't mean we can't be happy. It doesn't mean that at all. I think sometimes I drive my coworkers crazy at Miller Brothers because I'm always happy. Every once in a while I get a little stressed or whatever, got a lot of work to do, but I'm still happy. And, and, and I can tell you how many times, and I've said this before, I've told you this before, I know this, but I, people have said to me, it's like, Brian, what are you on? I tell them the same thing every time I'm on Jesus. That's truly what I'm on. We can be happy. Do you hear me today? You can be happy today. It's not a sin. It's not a crime, okay? We can be happy. That's what the Bible says, Psalm 146, verse 5. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. That's somebody who is happy-minded. We need to be a happy-minded people. Not only do we need to be heavenly-minded, but we need to be happy-minded. Just being happy in life. The psalmist in Psalm 42, he says, Why are you cast down? Why are you so depressed? He's asking himself this question. It's a rhetorical question he's asking himself. He says, why am I so depressed? He says, oh, my soul. And why art thou disquieted within me? He's, and he tells himself, listen, hope thou in God. He says, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He says, God will help me. No matter what trial you're going through, no matter what decision you're facing, no matter what life throws at you, God will help you. Plain and simple. And so he says, listen, we can be happy even through our trials and tribulations. It is a mindset of being happy. If, if nothing else, I want, you know what? To me, this is probably one of the most important points of this message. Because I see so many people today, Christian people, people who know that they're saved, know that they're going to heaven, know that this life is not all that there is, and they're not happy. I don't get that. Listen, you want to share stories? I'll tell you horror stories from my life. Not really. They're my stories. I'm not going to tell them with anybody, okay? I gave them to the Lord a long time ago. The things that I went through as a child growing up. I gave all that stuff over to the Lord. And then there came a time. I literally, there was a time in my life when I said, Brian, because I didn't used to be happy. I used to be very angry. I was an angry young man. I was a hateful young man. I was a spiteful young man. I truly was. You would not have liked me back then. Not too many people did. But after I got saved, after I trusted in Christ as my Savior, and when I finally got my head twisted on right, okay, and started going to church in my early 20s, there came a time in my life I thought, you know what? This is stupid. Am I allowed to say that from the pulpit? This is not smart, okay? So, yeah. But anyway, why go through life so angry? Why go through life so unhappy? Sure, all this stuff has happened. But my life going forward is a blank canvas. And if I have a happy mind, I'm going to have a happy life. And from that moment on, things began to change. The anger began to fall away. And the happiness started to flow. And listen, I'll tell you what, the Browns haven't even come close to the Super Bowl. And I'm still happy. I still am. The Indians were like one pitch away from World Series Championship. Jose Mesa. But anyway, so close, you know? It's, but I'm still happy. 
a happy man to this day. Happy minded. It's in our minds. That's, that's what a heavenly hope will do for us. And then when happiness fails, because it will, things happen, life happens and stuff like that. We also need to be joyful minded. There's a big difference about joyful mindedness. That's something that comes from within. It's not based on circumstances in life. Joy comes from within. But in Jeremiah 17, 7, let me read this verse to you. Jeremiah says this, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope is the, who, whose hope the Lord is. He says, Blessed is the man that trusts in God, whose hope is in God. Now, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. Okay? Jeremiah has a nickname. If you've been in church any length of time, perhaps you've heard it. I know I've said it before. Does anybody know what Jeremiah's nickname was? I'll give you a hint. He wrote the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah, and he wrote the book of Lamentations. You know what Lamentations are? Do you know what to lament means? It means to cry, to bewail, to bemoan. Jeremiah's nickname was the Weeping Prophet. That's who he is called. That's who he was known as because of the book of Lamentations. If you read the book of Lamentations, it can be pretty depressing. It really can Jeremiah preached in a time that Israel had been taken away into captivity during his life. They were in Israel, the Babylonians came, and they were taken away into captivity. And Jeremiah was in jail. And even the Jewish people, they didn't like him. And they said, yeah, leave him in jail. We don't like him. He lived a rough life. But he was joyful-minded because of these words. Again, this is the weeping prophet saying this, blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. My friends, today, yeah, life could be a mess, but we could be joyful minded knowing that my trust is in the Lord. When life is all said and done, when I get to the end of my life, you know, let's say I live a long and happy life or whatever, okay? Someday, one day, I'm going to pass from this life to the next. And I look forward to that day. I know that I've already won. I know that I'm on the winning side. I know that's what a joyful mind does. And it helps me through the rough times in my life. It truly does. And so, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. It's a heavenly mind. It's a happy mind. It's a joyful mind. I'm here today to tell you that you can be happy. It's a good thing. It really is. And we need to be a happy people. You know, who in the world would want to be saved and be part of a church or be part of a Christian body that's just always so stoic and sad and downcast and all, you can't do this and can't do that type of thing? Who would want to be a part? I wouldn't, you know? I want to enjoy my Christianity. I want to be able to be happy and serve the Lord in, in happiness and peace and joy and that sort of a thing, okay? So that's the first thing. If we're going to be heavenly minded, we have to have a heavenly mindset, okay? Secondly, it means looking up. You know, it's funny how many times, how much we spend looking down, especially now that everybody has a cell phone. You realize how much time we spend looking down, looking down at our phone, looking down in general. The Bible is replete with verses that tell us what? To do just the opposite, to look up. And you know, when we pray, usually when we pray, what do we do? We bow our heads and close our eyes. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. It's not what it shows us. Psalm 5.3 says, My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. And we'll what? We'll look up. My friends, God wants us to look up. It's a good thing to look up. Several years ago, I think I've shared this story before. You've probably seen it. But there was a lady. She was going through a mall. And she was looking down at her phone, not paying attention where she's going. And this mall had... A water fountain in the middle, of, you know, the, the atrium or whatever it was, a big old waterfall. And this woman, she's walking through the mall, looking down at her phone, not paying attention, and she comes upon the waterfall, or this, this water fountain thing in the middle, and it had a little wall around it. And she hit the wall, and, and she went, because she's busy looking down. I don't know how many remember seeing it or whatever. But what made it famous is that, you know, that the security camera caught this, and it went viral on, on the internet and stuff like that. You know the old saying, it's better to keep your mouth shut and have people think you a fool than to open your mouth and erase all doubt? This woman, if she just let it go, she'd have been fine. But no, she decided to sue the mall for releasing the video. And so now the whole world knew this woman's name. <laughs> you know, it's like, shh, 
You fell in the water fountain. No big deal. She never won anything. She never got anything out of it. The only thing she got out of it was to be infamous for the woman who fell in the fountain in the mall. You don't believe me? Look it up. You can find it, I'm sure. It's on YouTube somewhere. You can see it later and stuff like that. But the point is, is that we spend so much time looking down. We truly do. We spend so much time looking down. It went, you know, like that, that last song that we just read. He says, why are you so downcast? Why are we so depressed? We spend so much of our time looking down. When the Bible tells us that we need to look up, that's what we need to do. And one of the best things we can do is look up in prayer. Look up to our Heavenly Father and lift up our hands and our voices and our praise to Him. Looking up to that one who wants to lift us up today. Okay. So many people today, they want a hand out instead of a hand up. God wants to give us a hand up. He wants to lift us up. He wants us to lift up our eyes, lift up our head, lift up our voices, lift up our attitudes. That's what God would have us to be. That's what a heavenly hope is all about. Heaven is a beautiful place, and it's a place that is up. Where is it exactly? Oh, well, on the other side of Mars? No, we don't know, but it is up. The Bible is always telling us to look up. That's what he wants to do. And so our prayers are one of those things that will help you to look up today. That's why I encourage people as Christians, as believers today, that we need to be people of prayer. Talking with God, spending time with Him. When you're conversing, and I realize again, this is a lost art, because most of the time, you know, how we communicate with people, through the phone, through text messages, amen. Just standing there talking to people is a lost art. And because I knew this was part of our sermon, I kind of did a little bit of an experiment this week. And so people that I was talking to at work today, or this past week, I looked them in the eyeball when I was talking to them. You realize people don't look in the eye when they talk to you? You realize that? I guess I never really realized. I probably do the same thing as well because I was forcing myself that no matter whether it was a customer at the store or a co-worker or just anybody in general, that as I was talking to them, I looked them in the eye. And most people, even as they're telling you stories, they're looking all around everywhere but looking in your face. It's hard sometimes to look somebody in the face. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to lie to somebody when you're looking somebody in the face. Amen? But anyway, look up. When we look up today, I think we would just have a whole new perspective. You know, anymore, I can't see and hear so good and stuff like that. So when we go places, my wife's been doing a lot of the driving. Thank God for that. And it's amazing. You know, it's like we went out to um, Sandusky the other day to get a new suit for the wedding. But anyway, went on out to Sandusky, and I'm like, I'm like how long was that there? How long has that been there? She said it's been there for years. I've never noticed it before. Because I was always driving, and I didn't get to see all these things and stuff. You'd be amazed what you see when you actually look up and see what is around you. But today, look up, lift up your eyes, your voice, your countenance to heaven and spend time in prayer to God. That's one of the things about lifting up. Now listen, we're going to have trials. And trials are what cause us to look down. Psalm 40 verse 12, it says, innumerable evils have compassed me about. Is anybody in this room that's like that today <laughs> that feel that way? Oh, innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities or my sin have taken a hold upon me. Now watch, he says, so that I am not able to look up. That's how so many people are today. Because of all the things that we've gone through our, in our life and, and our own past so much of the time haunts us. My sins, my iniquities haunt us. That we feel like we just can't look up. And he says, they are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. And this psalmist, I didn't write it all down, but if you go back and read the rest of this, then he goes on later to say about how that he looks up to God, looks up to heaven. But our trials are what force our heads down. And that's why the psalmist in the other one says, why are you so downcast? Today, we need to be lifted up. You say, but preacher, you don't know what I'm going through. Doesn't matter. Turn it over to the Lord. Give it to God. Allow Him to heal you, to give you the joy and the peace that you need. It's the answer to our troubles. People don't believe me when I tell them that. They say, oh, preach, you don't know all that I'm going through. That doesn't matter. I went through stuff myself. It wasn't until I got myself in church that things started to change in my life. I'll never forget that. The day that I finally started going to church. It's like the old stories of going to school. I, was walk, I had to walk five, mil, five miles uphill to get to church. It wasn't quite that bad, but... From that day forward, I've been in church. Every Sunday that I possibly could be, I have been in church. And I know the difference that it's made in my life, the impact that it's made. And the more I put into this, the more I get out of it. 
The more I do for the Lord, the more He does for me. You cannot outgive God. He will bless in a big way. And so when the trials of life come, we need to look up. Don't look down. Don't let it force you down. But instead, look up. That's what we need to do. We need to be looking up. And Jesus Christ will give us the victory. This story in Mark is a story of a man that was blind. Could you imagine that being blind? I couldn't imagine that, you know? Even losing any one of my senses. But he was a man that was blind. And Jesus came to him. And this is the story where Jesus spit in the clay, or spit in the dirt, and he made a clay and put it on the guy's eyes and wanted him to wash up. Mark points out something that the other Gospels don't. Look at this in verse 25 here. It says, after that he put his hands again upon his eyes, he made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. Jesus told the man, go ahead, wash your eyes. So he did. But when he came up, Jesus asked him, he says, what do you see? And he says, I see men as trees. And that's when Jesus put his hands on him. The guy was still looking down. And Jesus put his hands on him. He says, look up. And when he did, he was restored and he saw everybody as they were. Could you imagine that day to be born blind and never see people ever? And then that day that you could see, I've seen videos of little babies, you know, that couldn't hear. And then they get implants and they can hear. The first time they hear their mom's voice, they're like, they get so excited and stuff. Like, I imagine that's how this man was. But Jesus took him, literally put his hands on him and he lifted, I can just picture him, lifting the man's head. Look up, would you? Jesus gave him the victory. And today he's saying the same thing to you in this life that we live. Are you downcast, discouraged, depressed, defeated, whatever? Is that how you feel? You have no joy, no happiness, nothing good going on in your life? Then Jesus is saying the same thing to you that he said to this man. Look up! I will give you that victory. But we've got to have faith to believe that. This man had faith to believe it. And he saw. Where's your faith today? Where's your hope today? My hope is in heaven. That's where we need to be. And in closing, I want us to realize why we need to look up. Okay? Why we need to look up. Because there's a coming a day, my friends, that the Son of Man will return. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Jesus in Luke 21, he's talking about the end times, when the end will come and Jesus will come to gather us together. And the Bible says when these things begin to come to pass, all these signs that he talks about, when you see all these things, my friends, we see a lot of things happening in this world today. A famous online preacher I saw just last week or the week before said that it's too late. God has judged the world because of this pandemic. I don't agree with him. But that's what he said. It's too late. It's never too late. As long as we believe, as long as we have faith, it'll never be too late. Until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, it'll never be too late. We must continue to press on, continue to preach, continue to pray, continue to press on for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we'll do that, God will bless. But he says, then when you see these things come to pass, and we see it, what does Jesus say? He says, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draw nigh. My friends, the worse or and worser, how's that for some bad English? <laughs> the worser and worser things get in this world and in this life today, it should cause us even more to lift up our heads saying, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I look forward to the day when I hear the sound of the trumpet. That's what the book of Revelation says. The trumpet shall sound, and you'll hear the voice of the archangel. The angel's going to say, Come up hither. Just like the angel told John in the book of Revelation, Come up hither. And the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds, and so shall ye ever be with the Lord. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That's where my hope is today. Not in this world, not in the things of this world, but I have a heavenly hope. And I look forward to that day. And until I get there, I'm going to do all that I can to make sure that my mansion is better than your mansion. <laughs> My friends, listen to me. Live your life for the Lord. Do all you can for Him. It will 